is a congressional candidate out of District 2, Steve Wendelin. He's uh, made the drive in from home to be on the program this morning. Steve, welcome. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, Amber. Steve, nice to meet you. Good to have you. So what time did you leave home this morning? Oh, God, what time did I leave home? Uh, about 7. I, I went sitting out in the parking lot for a little bit, just listening to the last couple of guests. Oh, that's and, cool. And uh, getting acclimated. Okay. So uh, on your last couple of guests, one, I want to... One, come to Phil's defense, there's nothing wrong with clover in your yard. It's good for the <laughs> pollinators. It's good for the environment. All right. No, it's not. Yeah, it, 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 It's a strangler. <laughs> clover is like the Boston strangler, man. It just it, All the innocent little, happy little grasslings, this clover comes along and strangles them at the roots, Steve. Pure, pure grass lawn is a desert for pollinators. I'm just putting that out there. My next door neighbor, we share part of our lawn because his driveway borders my property. And he's got about 10 feet of lawn that's borders mine and he's got clover in his. <laughs> so when my lawn guy came by, I said, hit that a little bit if you don't, there, if you don't mind, just get that stuff. It's creeping into my yard. You cloverers, I tell you. Yeah. <laughs> Steve, where are you headed next on, on your campaign trail? Oh, wow. Uh, another interview. And then um, let's see Friday. I have a meet the candidate out at the VFW in Grafton. Uh, actually it's at the senior center. It's being sponsored by the VFW. Mm -hmm. in Grafton and then forest festival on Saturday down in Elkins. So it's just constantly go, 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 go. I think I have another meet the candidate as well. Saturday midday at in Tucker County as well. When's your next Berkeley or Jefferson or Morgan County appearance? Just had a whole bunch of them. Um, and then, uh, of course, Friday was, uh, the, uh, Kennedy, uh, excuse me, the Roosevelt Kennedy dinner down in Charleston. So it's just been kind of a blur and um, and just constantly driving uh, hither and yon. Next Berkeley event, I actually don't know. I'd have to look at my calendar. So What are you hearing from the people? So what I'm hearing from the people is, one, um, obviously we're still kind of riding the wave from the, the national level candidate. Um, and so there's a lot of positivity out there. I do want to bring up one thing that Delegate... Hornsby mentioned is when he was talking about how it sounds like a foregone conclusion that Patrick Morrissey is going to be the next governor. That is not the case. There is an, a little thing called an election between now and, and then. And what people don't realize is the numbers. And here are the numbers. 40, 30, 25. Statewide registration, 40% are Republican, 30% are Democrat, 25% are independents. Last time I checked, 30 and 25 is greater than 40. And that's, here's the thing. The independents really have a voice in this election, and it's huge here in West Virginia. You, you mentioned the, the national, and I think for the Democrats, they got all had a breath of relief when uh, uh, Harris got in the race because it was not it was very stagnant with Biden there. Now there's some uh, some energy. Uh, but it comes down to money. Uh, Steve Williams has is, is not been able to raise very much money. Uh, and uh, so that's, uh, he already had a name recognition problem, even though he's well known in the, in the uh, uh, Huntington area. He's not as well known throughout the state, but you have to have money to make that change. Well, maybe. So, so the money thing is kind of personal for me because um, I purposely set out one of my top three is I want to get money out of politics. Um, it's gotten to the point where it almost is a foregone conclusion. Whoever raises the most money is going to get elected. That needs to change. One, um, I don't think it is true. I would like to think the, the American voters are better than that. And so I made a conscious decision. I don't accept PAC money or special interest money. Uh, it's, one, it's actually caused some issues with endorsements for me because things like some of the unions don't know what to make with me because I don't accept their money. I'll accept their endorsement, but not their money. So, you know, Steve Williams is just an amazing guy. The, the ticket really is pretty amazing. And if he can turn Huntington, West Virginia around, he can turn West Virginia around and West Virginia needs to be turned around. So uh, it's just a matter of getting out there. The problem we're having uh, up and down the ticket is the Republicans won't meet us and debate us publicly. They won't, they won't go head to head with us on policy issues. Um, I don't know if this is a conscious tactic across their ticket or not, but it's really getting quite frustrating. 
Um, have you had any public appearances with Riley Moore? I have not. Um, every single one has either been canceled or somehow, you know, he has other things that come up. I don't know what's more important than talking to the people and letting the people decide, you know, when we're side by side on where we stand on issues. Have uh, you had or any, you, you say you have had scheduled ones with him and they've, they've not come through? Uh, well, one, I did uh, formally invite him. I congratulated him for winning his primary and I, and I did invite him to debate me. Um, I sent that letter out and there's been no response. Um, the Dominion was supposed to do a panel discussion with uh, Riley and I. Uh, they've been bought out by Ogden News and that all of a sudden evaporated. So I don't know if that's a decision of Ogden News to be more apolitical or not. And then um, I had some other things uh, that were scheduled and he has canceled them. So I don't know what to make of that, but I do know that it's a huge disservice to the um, the population of West Virginia, the people that are going to vote to make that educated decision. I know we have candidate forums October 15 and 22, and Riley's uh, staff has him in different states on those days as the schedule goes. So we will not be able to have the two of you together at our candidate forum. We'd like to try to get something together in studio, and Riley has a assured me that he will find a day to make that happen in the studio. So we'll see if that happens. We'll, we'll see. You know, I'll be here. I mean, and I will, I will move heaven and earth to, to get here. And I don't understand why he is outside the state as much as he is. Um, if you look at his FEC reporting, he spends a whole lot of money on travel yet. I have not, I've been all over the second district for the last year, 27 counties, 10,000 square miles. I don't see any evidence of him. Even during the primary, I met all the other Republicans that were running in the primary, except for him. And I don't understand. I, I guess it's a tactic that he thinks by having an R by his name, he doesn't need to campaign. Well, let's talk about the practicality of winning an election in West Virginia with the way it currently sits, even with the 40, 30, 25 breakdown, Steve. The question that many conservative-minded voters are going to have is, will Steve Wendelin vote with Donald Trump if he wins the election? Will he vote with Kamala Harris if she wins the election? I'll vote for the interests of West Virginia. Um, it's, you know, it's voting straight ticket in an election isn't necessarily the right answer. And voting just because I'm a Democrat and caucusing with Democrats. No, I'm going to caucus with the interests of West Virginia. I'll caucus with the rural vote. I'll caucus where, where, that, where the money needs to hit West Virginia. You know, you were just saying how much of the state money comes from the federal budget. Well, you need somebody out there to advocate that and not somebody that's just going to say, well, that's not my party. OK, so let's say the former president becomes elected again. Um, first of all, the president doesn't make the laws. It's Congress. And that's one of the things that I'm frustrated with, too, is is all the attention is on the presidential race. Well, there's some really important down ticket races in this election and the control of Congress is in the balance. Quite frankly, I think it's provides for a healthier thing when we have those razor thin margins, whether it's the Republicans in charge or the Democrats, because that means the two parties have to work together and that makes, you know, better, better policies for the, the country. Steve, your, your statement is perfect. If we were teaching a civics course, <laughs> it is, but, the legislative branch of government really abandoned their responsibilities many years ago to the White House. And the, and the president really is the one who sets the agenda and decides what law he really wants passed, tax cuts, for instance, and get makes that happen through the leadership of the party that's in the legislative branch. But I think for the last probably 40 years or so, it's been the president who's really been setting the tone for the laws that get passed at least the bigger ones. It's true, um, and I, I do acknowledge that. And that's one of the things where my candidacy is different, is I'm willing to go in there and say, listen, we have to take control of the purse back. You know, the power of the purse, that's the part of the separation of powers. And that's why I won't say, well, I will definitely caucus with Democrats or I'll definitely caucus with this group or that group. 
I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do what my constituents need and sometimes want me to do. So, um, so that's where we're at now. Part of the problem is, so we see things like we had an immigration bill and it gets, doesn't even make it out onto the floor. What I think you're seeing now is with the current speaker, Mike Johnson is because these razor thin, um, majorities that we have that it only takes a few dissenters to, to approve something or kill something and even threaten the speakership. Um, I'm actually kind of glad that we had a little bit of an adjustment period and the Republican party kind of led the way this way um, because there was too much power in the speakership and the, the, the power needs to be returned back to the people, which is through their individual representatives. Yeah, uh, good morning, Steve. Uh, I want to go through your platform in just a second, but going back to uh, uh, the chances of, of winning the election, have there been polls for your district? Do you have any idea at all how you're doing? No polls. One, because I can't afford polls, because yeah. like I said, I, I'm doing this on a shoestring. Um, and the only poll I really care about is the one on November. I seriously doubt if uh, Riley's campaign has paid any money for polls. So I really don't know, and I don't think he knows either. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm looking at your web page, and I'm looking at your platform, and there's a lot of uh, several uh, items I'd like to, that we could spend the whole time discussing. Let me go through your platform very quickly, then ask you to pick one or two that you'd like to discuss. One would be health care reform. Second, reversing climate change. Pro-choice, a balanced budget. Ending partisan politics. Best of luck with that one. Uh, <laughs> tax reform. High-speed internet and cell coverage. Campaign finance reform. Reversing globalization. Digital privacy. And reducing poverty, poverty, poverty and homelessness. Now, a lot of these are... Uh, uh, some are aspirational. Some are apple pie and motherhood. Uh, do you, which ones do you think you have a realistic, realistic chance in getting some action on should, be, should you be elected? Well, I think one of them is, and this is the, you know, the elephant in the room, is, is the pro-choice. Listen, um, we have taken some huge steps backwards when it comes to women's health. And one of the things that I hear consistently when I'm out on the campaign trail is that one thing West Virginians really don't like is the government in their business. And I can't think of anything more intrusive than legislators deciding how and when to start a family. And you're starting to hear these stories that have that, you know, it's like something from the 1950s of women, healthy women dying because of complications due to pregnancies. You know, everyone wants to think, well, everyone wants to, you know, get pregnant and, and the, the, the fetus is, is healthy and happy and, and everything's fine. But that's not the case. And so when a doctor, you know, needs to, oh, hang on a second, I'm not sure. I need to go talk to the lawyer first to see if I can perform a procedure. And we have women dying of sepsis. That's insane. So we need to knock it off. You know, these are decisions that are very personal and they're decisions by an individual, their family member. If you want to involve your clergy in it, that's fine too. But a bunch of leg legislators off, you know, down in Charleston or in Washington, D.C., making that decision, that's not okay. So as I like to say, mountaineers are always free. Well, they should be free to choose. So that's that one. I believe it will be on 11 ballots this year uh, uh, as, far, as far as constitutional amendment in 11 different states. Well, again, S Steve Williams have tried to get it as a moratorium on, a, or excuse me, a referendum on the West Virginia ballot and got shut down. No, it never happened. Yet. And so we need to look at that. Um, it's... Uh, I was going to, I was going to uh, ask another one. Campaign finance reform, that's kind of the root of a lot of what you've been talking about. Exactly. If you, and I urge people all the time, go out to fec.gov. We have to report every contribution and we have to report expenditures. And I will tell you, facts are a stubborn thing. And if you look at where the money comes from and who is financing which campaign, 
it is very, very eye-opening, um, especially at the national and the state level. Um, but you'll hear about even local races for county commissioner and for sheriff and things like that, and they're having to raise tens of thousands of dollars for local races. It's nuts, and we need to reverse this. Um, you know, and part of the part of the solution is we need to involve the fourth estate. We need to get journalism back into reporting this, and people not feeling like they have to raise, you know, millions of dollars for a race. Riley Moore has raised over a million dollars. I've raised about thirty thousand. That's all from friends, family, and you know, my neighbor West Virginians. Now, Riley Moore, a million dollars. Uh, you're probably suggesting a lot of that comes from PAC money. Oh, I'm not suggesting it is. And if you go to FCC, so it's PAC money, it's corporate money. Um, and then how the corporations kind of double down on it is they may have a pro political action fund. And then each of their board members will donate. And the, the spouses of the board members donate. So one corporation like, let's say, First Energy, you know, yeah, they're, they're, they're limited to about $3,000, but if you have each board member <laughs> and then their spouse contributing, now all of a sudden they've got a whole lot of clout in that particular race. Mm -hmm. There's also things that come up too, like the dark money. Um, there was an article way back when on crypto, on the crypto lobby, the crypto lobby has dumped a ton of money into these races, especially congressional races, because that industry doesn't want to be regulated. So they're investing in politicians who they think will keep them from being regulated. Well, I'm sorry, crypto is going to be the next dot bomb. If it's not regulated, that could bring down a lot of our economy. Um, if it goes very wrong, it needs to be regulated. So they invested $750,000 is what I've been told, what was reported in the Washington Post into Riley Moore's campaign. Um, and that's money that's not reportable. It's money that they spent on his behalf. And, and that's what made a difference in the Republican primary. Yeah. Pardon me for kind of shotgun, but I, but a lot of these items, I'd like to get mm -hmm. at least uh, yep. some idea. Reversing globalization. So one of that is there's a whole lot of talk about, you know, tariffs now and things like that. One, we need to make sure that Americans control American industry. Right now there's talk of the Japanese buying um, US Steel. US Steel. Um, we need to stop that and the federal government needs to do that. That's something that it was well within the power of Congress to do, to pass laws and, and we need to do that because that's the only thing that stems the flow of jobs out of the country. Um, and so that's what I mean by reversing globalization. Um, there was a, a book several years out, The World is Flat. Well, it's not. And it comes down to, to us making those regulations to, one, protect U.S. industry, and then also keeping U.S. industry in the U.S. where they're paying taxes and not easily allowing corporations to offshore. Because it's basically, we can't, it's tax avoidance is what it is. And so... You know, if we need to incentivize, you know, it needs to be stick and carrot. Yeah. Uh, probably have time for one, maybe two more. Digital privacy. So by that, I'm not talking about Big Brother. I'm not talking about government. I'm talking about, I was in, I was a communications officer in the Navy. Um, I've seen what we are able of doing digitally. Folks, you don't need to worry about Big Brother snooping on you. They have, they have other things they're looking at. Uh, at least that's where they're supposed to be looking. I'm talking about Madison Avenue. Um, right now, every one of us has a digital fingerprint. And that digital fingerprint is bought and sold on the open market. Basically, every click that you make is being tracked. And that information is being sold. And there is a profile of you online. And we need to regulate how that is used. Um, when I used to teach uh, responsible computing um, out at the Naval Academy, I would tell midshipmen to go back to their uh, rooms and do a Google search on, let's say, vinyl siding, because every midshipman needs vinyl siding. 
And then I would tell them then pay attention to the ads that would start showing up in their social media and they would start getting ads on for vinyl siding and that. So there really are some huge privacy concerns and basically we need to hold these search engines and, and social media corporations responsible for protecting our privacy. And finally a balanced budget. How do we achieve that? <laughs> so one on time would, would yeah. be helpful. Yeah. Continuing resolutions, by the way, whenever you hear the term continuing resolution, you need to hear wasting taxpayers money. Um, and we're constantly in a continuing resolution. So balanced budget. First of all, there's enough money there. One, um, First of all, there's a whole lot of waste in government. I was in DOD. I know you were with NOAA. Within the Department of Defense, there's a whole lot of waste. If we just curb that waste, we can still have the strongest defense in the world. And just we need to be more efficient and effective at it. Also, uh, just like uh, Vice President Harris is talking about, everyone needs to pay their fair share. And we're not talking about the middle class. We're talking about those upper bands of, of multimillionaires and the billionaires need to pay their fair share. The corporations need to pay their fair share. If we do that, we can balance the budget. Last time we had a balanced budget was in 2001. By the way, last time it was passed on time was 1997. That's nuts. Steve, we have a minute left. Yep. Right. So I'm going to give it to you to address the audience and let them know why they should vote for you. So what I want you all to do is do your research, do your research up and down. If you vote, straight ticket, you're really doing yourself and your family a huge disservice. So please research your candidates, go out, look at my online presence, look at uh, Riley Moore's online presence, and look at who's funding us and who do you think will represent you best. Please do that research. Please research Glenn Elliott and Steve Williams. And remember, it's not over till it's over. There's a whole lot of fight left in, in all of us. And again, please just educate yourselves. If the, if if we can't get the education in the press, at least go online and do your own research. Steve, and where do they find out more about you online? So I'm at www.wendelinforcongress.com. I'm also on Facebook, Wendelin for Congress. If you can't figure out how to spell my name, that's Sailor, all one word, thatsailor.com is kind of a, a, a back way into the website. And, uh, and you should all be able to figure out how to spell that. Steve, thanks for coming in. Thank you for having me. Appreciate you making the drive. We, Ed, by the way, I'm uh, not sure if they're running late or uh, whatever. We had some folks uh, scheduled on the program today, I think, from the Good Time Show Choir and their Apple Dumpling Sale, but they were not in the lobby. So we asked Steve Wendelin to hang out with us a little bit longer, uh, a couple more things we can get into, and he's graciously agreed to do that. I had, I had more time in that first segment, Steve. I would have asked you to follow up on this question because this comes up uh, every election, and usually it's stated by a uh, Democrat, and that is that the rich are not paying their fair share. And this came up, I think, on our Friday show as well. So I looked it up to find out what percentage of all the taxes paid are paid by, quote unquote, wealthy people. And they say the top 1% of earners in this country pay 45% of all the taxes. That sounds like a fair share to me. You, you, do you maintain that that's not a fair share? Because that sounds like, an off the, like the 1% are pulling their weight and then some. That does sound like a fair share, but here's here's the issue. That's for income. There's a lot of games that get played. So like folks like Elon Musk, it's they there are virtually no capital gains because what they do is if they let's say want to buy something like Twitter, um, they will put their stock up as collateral so there are no capital gains on that. And then they'll take out loans and then they'll take out more loans to pay off those loans. So they never actualize, I think I'm using that word correctly, uh, actualize those capital gains. So they're never taxed. So they're able to move around mass sums of wealth without being taxed on it. You and I can't do things like that. And part of it is, is the tax code is so complex. Honestly, um, if what I would love to see is let's take the tax code out in the parking lot and set it on fire and come back with, I don't know, a 20 page document, um, flat tax. 
I would be very interested in, in really studying that and really looking at that and just saying, this is what you're going to pay. And all these loopholes and everything else, getting rid of them. Warren Buffett talks about that a lot as he says, the, the problem is, is there's so many advantages for the wealthy that the wealthy can take advantage of that regular people can't. Well, but even so, let's assume that what you said is true. Okay. And I don't know if it is or isn't, but let's okay. assume what you said is true. If the 1% are avoiding paying taxes like Elon Musk, then how are they paying 45% of all the taxes that are being paid? I would really have to look at those numbers. I, I would really want to take a, a a deep dive on that and how are they being paid. The other thing too is um, you'll hear about billionaires being philanthropists. Well, they put them into foundations, but then they control um, how that money is spent as they should. It's their foundation. But a lot of it is they'll do things like rent space from themselves. And so they're generating income based off of their charitable giving. And so it's kind of a, a shell game. And like I said, it's overly complex. And in the U.S., we're really good about layering law upon law upon law, which is what creates the loopholes. And so what we really need to do is really look at the entire tax code and say, listen, we need to be able to bring this amount of money in and take care of it. Things like just removing the cap on social security. You know, there's a cap after you make so much money, you stop paying anything above that into social security. Well, I've, I've heard that if we remove that cap, guess what? We're going to extend the life and the viability of social security. Why not? Why, why have that cap on there? Well, I would say this, because I've, I've done a lot of research on this one, too. You get into a couple of areas where I've done a lot of reading. Okay. And that amount goes up with inflation every year, right? So if you look back 50 years ago, that amount was, I think, $19,000 or $27,000. And now it's $164,000 or $165,000. So that amount does go up every year. It's supposed to go up with inflation. So you can make an argument about the real inflation of, you know, adjusted value of, of the money, but it does go up because, I mean, and that's a simple search. You can see how it's right. gone up over the years. But the next question I have on that is, as you make more money, the federal income tax rate also increases. So if you go to the top income tax rate, which I think is 30 34, 35 percent. And then you add your state income tax rate on top of that. And then you on top of that, throw that 7 percent Social Security Medicare tax back in there. Plus your employer pays that, too. Right. Now we're talking about 50 percent of what I make. Not going to me. It goes to the government. That sounds immoral and unjust to me that because I'm successful, Half of what I make should go to a government entity, and I have no control over paying it. It gets taken out of my check. But you are talking about people who are essentially wage earners, and that's not the issue. It's not the wage earners that are playing by the rules. It's the hedge fund managers who have so much passive income. The CEOs, if you look at the amount that CEOs' compensation has gone up, over the last 40 years, 50 years. Well, but that's not what uh, your point was in the yeah. beginning. Your point in the beginning was raising the Social Security tax on wage earners. Right. Now you're talking about instituting a Social Security tax on other types of income. Well, no, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying in taxpayers in general. So, so yes. But, again, these are things that, and I'm glad that you do your research, and, that, and I'm going to trust you on that one, because I haven't mm -hmm. looked at that, per se, because I've been focused on more things like, you know, um, political finance reform and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you, the system is definitely broken. <laughs> yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think anybody would, would, would disagree with me that it needs to be broken. It needs to be overhauled. And rather than having lobbyists come in and write laws and suggestions for tax codes, they're more than suggestions, uh, actually writing the laws, we need to get in there and start utilizing the federal government to truly study this, use those professional staffers and look at all those studies that have already been generated. By the way, 
um, for the folks out there, every study that's done by the government is accessible by you. And I don't remember the, the exact website, but Congress does thousands of studies every year. And those all have to be published. So that's a really good source of information on things like tax law, immigration law, and everything else. So. Go, going back to your original question and Steve's response to it, I think you're both right. You're looking at it from different perspectives. Mm -hmm. The number that you gave, the 43%, were in absolute terms. Uh, what Steve's response was in relative terms. We None of us uh, looking across the fence want to be paying more than a neighbor. Uh, even though we may be paying the same thing absolutely, we don't want to be paying more than a neighbor. When we're talking about the uh, uh, the very very wealthy the one percenters uh, they may pay forty three percent of the total forty five forty five percent but what they do not do is what they do do I guess is they pay a lot less of their total earnings total uh, in, uh, total capital than what we as a, set, a resident regular citizen do we may pay thirty five percent of our total income they may pay. 15% of the total income. That's a relative argument. So you're both right, but it's which way you're looking at it from the absolute or looking at it from the relative. I think Dylan's doing some fact checking right. back there. Go ahead, Dylan. It, uh, yeah, I think trying to get at what you were, uh, what Steve referred to just a minute ago, and you were saying, I'm not sure if that's true or not. Uh, I think looking back, I think maybe part of what he's talking about is the U.S. Treasury estimates, this is from 2021 at least, top 1%. Uh, underpays their taxes by $163 billion annually. This is from the Treasury Department, Natasha Sarin, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy. Do they define what they mean by underpaying their taxes by $163 billion or how they come about that figure? I'm um, looking through uh, essentially this article about it on USA Today says through foundations, through property, gifting, family offices, investments, and moving residency, among other things. I guess. So, so the point is they may pay 45% of the total income tax, but what Dylan's saying and what Steve was saying relative to their, their holdings, what they should be paying, they're paying a lot less. Well, and that goes back to tax law. Right. Right. So, for instance, if you have a capital gain, you can avoid paying taxes on it if you donate it to charity. Right. Good thing or bad thing? Well, um, for, for those of us in the working class, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. That, that charitable giving is, is a good thing. However, if you have 100% control over the foundation and some of that money actually comes back to you as it, as it can, um, then you have some problems. Um, uh, Robert Reich, whether you love him or hate him, uh, has done some really good videos on this, on how these charitable foundations work. So the other portion of it, too, is you still need to give to the commons, you know, uh, charitable foundations do not fix potholes. They do not build infrastructure. They do not help with our cell phone connectivity in West Virginia. Um, so that type of issue. So it's just a matter of, of we really need to simplify the tax code. And right now we're heading in the opposite direction of that. It's getting more and more complex and more and more convoluted. I don't disagree. We need to simplify the tax code. The tax code seems like more of a behavioral code for what the government wants people to do than it does as a way of collecting taxes. I, I, I agree with you on that. And there's a meme out there. <laughs> My wife and I have been joking about it saying, you know what? How about no more billionaires? You get to $999 million um, and you get a trophy saying you won capitalism. And everything after that is taxed at 100%. Um, but, well, I, but, you know. <laughs> I, I don't even like the sounds of that yeah. one, Steve. But to simplify the tax code would be penalizing nonprofits, a lot of the charitable groups. They're the ones that benefit from a more complicated tax code, among others. It, it's, it's funny you say that. So one of the things in my background is I taught ethics for five years at the Naval Academy. And when we talk about why in ethics, one of the things that we talk about is why people do good things. And, and, and they, there's actually, you can profit from that 
from different ways through just how you feel about yourself, how people view you and things of that nature. I think people will always give. They will always, there will always be charities, things like that. So the idea is that you keep, you know, billionaires, you tax them instead of allowing for these foundations, things are still going to get funded. And by who? By the, but, the way they're funded, the way they're funded now, I would, again, I don't have numbers in front of me, but I would hazard guess that United Way gets more money from folks like you and me than they do by Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos. But I think those other organizations, let's use uh, uh, National Public Radio, for example, they get money from you and I, but they also get a lot of money from the euphemistic Bill Gates of this world. They do, and they also get money from, oh, the Sacklers, who, you know, are infamous now for the opioid crisis. So, again, you know, I, I get it, but I, I, I honestly, and again, you know, just as you were talking to me during the break, do I have, you know, data on this or is it my gut? My gut tells me that charitable giving is still going to be there. And um, and national, you know, like public radio, I think will still get funded. And it got funded long before there was such a thing as a billionaire, you know, in the, in the you know, the 60s and 70s when these things got started and really rolling. It was the public that was financing them. Well, and that's the public through taxpayer dollars. Yeah. And we can get into an argument as to whether the, the public should be funding radio and public radio and public television stations. And I'm sure there's a pretty good number of people who would disagree that that's something that the government should do. Uh, and Including a lot of legislation in West Virginia. Well, and, and I might be one of them, too. I mean, I, I, in this business, if we don't sell advertising, we go out of business mm -hmm. tomorrow. Okay. Period. End of story. So if you're a public radio station, they get underwriting from corporations and individuals and, and donations and such, but they also get taxpayer funded dollars. And there are a lot of people out there, and it, it's pretty hard to deny that it's true, who feel that public radio is slanted against conservatism. So if you are a person paying tax dollars into a government funded radio or television station, and that station in turn is taking public editorial positions that generally don't favor conservatism. I don't know why a taxpayer should have to fund that. You know what? I'll give you that one. I'll absolutely give you that one. If private media will then start actually reporting news and stop with the sensationalism and the entertainment and everything else. Mm -hmm. So when it truly becomes fair and balanced, then maybe we don't need you know, public radio. I will tell you something like C-SPAN is pretty invaluable. Maybe if it's just a matter of allowing people to get to the facts themselves, mm -hmm. we don't need people's opinions, right? We can make all, we can make up our own opinion. What we need is we need the facts so we can form those opinions. And that's where we need to really get rid of kind of the talking heads and get back to fact-based reporting. And I'm sorry, not everything is breaking news. Okay, so well, and, by the, way, and the problems on both sides of it. Steve Wendland is our guest candidate for Congress, and I think part of the problem with that, Steve, is people confuse public opinion with news. Yes. The, the news should never have public opinion in it. The news should never never have the newscaster's opinion in it. But the programs that follow, which are generally talking heads dissecting what happened during the course of the day, that's where opinion comes in, and that's perfectly acceptable so long as it's not being presented as an official news story. And then you watch the shows that you want to watch and, and whatever. And capitalism determines if those shows succeed. If, for instance, nobody watched talking head shows giving opinions, those shows would go away in a second. They'd be replaced by something else that people would watch because that's how capitalism works. If you're doing a program nobody's watching or listening to, then the advertisers don't want to advertise on it and that show goes away. You mentioned C-SPAN, which I agree. It's a phenomenal non-opinion base information just providing facts is that publicly financed or is that privately financed? Is it, that is finance it's publicly financed it is public yeah. okay. and that is a it's actually congress actually directs that that's done mm -hmm. yeah and and i don't have any issues with that being public uh, financed by uh congress it's 
basically uh, TV of the yeah. laws as they're being made and passed. That's and, invaluable. And they offer very, very little in the way of personal opinions. Right. There, there is. Like now, there is some smoke and mirrors that happens on C-SPAN. Yeah. You'll, yeah. you'll see your local representative up there giving this great oratory and everything else. Well, if they would just pan back a little bit, you'd find out that the entire – you know, chambers empty, but that's it's, always, that's always the case. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Steve, you, you've talked about ways of trying to raise revenues for taxes. Any plans on your part of how to cut spending? So again, I always kind of come back to the same thing. I was in the Navy for 39 years, uh, both commissioned and enlisted active duty and reserve. So every permutation of that, and there is just an enormous amount of waste. Um, and if we could just cut the waste, there'd be enough to fund all the other agencies easily. Um, even just how we man things. Um, one of the numbers I love to put out there is there are more Department of the Navy civil servants than there are active duty Marines. Think about that for a second. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that these civil servants are, are a waste. What I'm saying is Maybe we need to move them around to things like, oh, you know, uh, you know, to the border or to the border, uh, to immigration courts or to the EPA or to NOAA, let's say, and all these other agencies that that are really kind of part of our national defense. Just you just have to open that aperture up a little bit. So things like that. The other thing, too, is. In the Department of Defense is the only industry I know of where the people assume the risk for research and development. When a new weapon system is developed, um, if it fails, it's already been paid for by um, the people, by taxpayers' monies. Vice, Raytheon taking the hit or Boeing taking the hit or Northrop Grumman or someone like that. And it's just the way that the contracting system is set up. We have really, again, there's lots of place for lots of reforms. During World War II, I love this. The requirements for what became the Jeep is on one page, mm -hmm. <laughs> typewritten, double-spaced. Um, and the government said, the Army said, we need this. It has to meet these requirements. And then industry went out and figured it out. And we got the Willys Jeep out of it. We don't do that anymore. And so if you watch things like there was an old movie a while ago called the Pentagon Wars, and it just shows just the ludicrousy of what happens when lawmakers get involved in making defense decisions based on where parts are made and things of that nature. Yeah, part of, and I agree, there's a lot of waste in DOD, uh, a lot of waste throughout the government, I believe. Uh, but DOD, there's a mentality of redundancy. On a ship, for example, you have three watches. Every position is uh, uh, has their th triplicated uh, because in the event of a war, you got to be able to go 24 hours a day, seven days a week for days after days. And that same mentality, same philosophy, percolates through all of DOD. There's a phenomenal amount of redundancy. Well, it is, but it's, but the redundancy also doesn't have to happen there. So let's say the littoral combat ship. All right. Two were designed, two were built, and the Navy was going to pick the better one. Well, Congress came back and said, no, you have to buy both. So now we have two training pipelines. Now we have two um, logistics uh, tails. On that note, Steve, we're going to take our final commercial break. We are back with the final 50 seconds after these.